Hi there, welcome to our conversation with John Kabat-Zinn. And in this segment, we're gonna talk about uh, John's new book, which is the first of a four-part series uh, that I've read about half of it. And, but I also read the, the whole book. The original book was Coming to Our Senses, is that correct? And, yep. when, when did, and now John has done, a, it's a big job of taking that longer book and kind of chunking it down to four separate books. And I think you were updating it as you kind of rewrote it. Yes, updating it and uh, in particular, new and fairly extensive forwards that actually position the content of the book in relationship to the moment we find ourselves in now in 2018, where uh, in one way you could say the world is very different now than the way it was in 2005 when uh, Coming to Our Senses came out. Uh, and one of the things I investigate is like how different it is on a lot of different levels and how much exactly the same it is too. That the human species and human beings are pretty much the same, even though we're much more, you know, driven by the digital revolution and so forth, and much more in some sense at risk for becoming slaves of the digital um, uh, capacities that are so amazing that have been developed in that period of time. So uh, for me, it was really a labor of love and to, to go back to these books, which to a very large degree, because they're about mindfulness, are really timeless because they're about the present moment and how to be in wise embodied relationship with your life unfolding in the only moment any of us ever get. So from that point of view, um, it's fine to put this out in a new form for a new generation. And uh, I felt really very positive about it. And the forewords to each one of the books are really meant to position it and, and in some sense bring into focus for the reader what's transpired in the uh, past, uh, you know, 13 years since, since the, the original came out. It's a lot of fun to read. And I, it was kind of like a whole mi mindfulness experience actually reading it. It's, it's not a fad, but it's no, it is, it is going exponential. Uh, the interest in it, and in fact, the deep practice of it as well. And a lot of that is driven, Steve, as, as you probably know, and as I emphasize in book through, three, in book three of this whole thing, uh, by uh, the fact that we started studying it 40 years ago, because I had this very real sense that if meditation was going to be something that, you know, large numbers, if not the majority of Americans would ultimately take up, that it had to be commonsensical. It had to make total sense. And it also had to be supported by an evidence base where skeptical people would say, well, holy cow, I mean, there's all this research out there by very credible scientists, psychologists, neuroscientists, uh, you know, uh, basic scientists, interested in the question of the mind-body connection, and now with new technologies, uh, being able to show really remarkable changes in our bodies, in our brains, in, on, in our genome and so forth, when we actually practice what from the outside looks a lot like nothing. Like, <laughs> what is this, all this meditation stuff? You know, from the outside looks like nothing. From the inside, it's just about everything because it's like, becoming more intimate with your own experience and being able to navigate the ups and downs of an extremely stressful world uh, with some kind of integrity, dignity, ethical foundation, and so forth. And that's a tall order in this world. So I think that's why we're not only, in some sense, dying from mindfulness, we're starving from mindfulness. And, and but the beauty of it is that it's not a thing. It's not, it's not a doing, it's a, it's a being. It's a way of being in wise relationship with all of life experience, inwardly and outwardly. And then transcending even the dualism of inner and outer. So that's a tall order for human beings. But on the other hand, that's the invitation. 
And so book one is basically meant to sketch the landscape in which one would come to such a radical decision as to make time during the 24 hours that everybody gets for being as opposed to just running around doing, 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 and then dropping into bed and getting up the next day and doing, 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 and just always on your devices or always just pushing through this moment to get to a better moment at some future time that's never going to happen. So before we get into um, book one, like the specifics of book one, just give us a run through of what the four books are. And then the remainder of our little chat now, I think we'll look a little deeper into uh, okay. what book one is. Okay, so book one is called uh, Meditation Is Not What You Think. And the subtitle is Mindfulness and Why It's So Important. So this sort of sketches the landscape. Book two is, fall, is called Falling Awake, okay? Because that's really what meditation is. And really it's not just sitting in a cross-legged posture like a statue in the British Museum or in some temple. It's really about every moment of your life being fully present and embodied for it. And that includes all the stressful, dysphoric, horrible moments too, the good, the bad, and the ugly, so to speak, or what Zorba the Greek called the full catastrophe. So book two, Falling Awake, uh, is about mindfulness in everyday life, and that actually describes in great detail how somebody who was convinced by book one that this was important and understood the background of it would actually bring it into their lives, or if they are already a meditation practitioner, which so many millions of Americans are now, which was not true in 1979 when I started this work in the stress of mindfulness-based stress. Or even 2005. I mean, or it's even 2005 when the book first came out. So much more has, has penetrated the culture that, um, that they could really, you know, sort of make use of book two to, to um, integrated into life in ways that would be profoundly meaningful. And then life itself becomes the teacher. It's not John Kabat-Zinn or anybody else. Life becomes the teacher. And the third book I called The Healing Power of Mindfulness, which uh, is a title that I was actually going to use for my first book, Full Catastrophe Living. It was one of many, which I wrote, was published in 1990. But there's so much evidence now that mindfulness is really transformative and healing in profound ways. And uh, so I uh, basically, that book sketches out uh, a variety of studies that came out of uh, my center and other centers, collaborations and so forth, and recent evidence about what uh, the science is saying. And then also uh, the second part of it really has to do with what we even mean by healing. And how do, and for me, it's like, it's not fixing or curing. Healing is coming to terms with the actuality of things. And that coming to terms is a sort of deep dive into the unwanted often, but that's the only way through to some kind of healing is actually to go in, to enter into and put the welcome mat out for the unwanted, the unpleasant, the severely challenging, the impossible to imagine that actually happens. So, you know, lots of trauma, tragedy and so forth. And I wouldn't be, we wouldn't be having this conversation if mindfulness didn't in some sense already demonstrate to the world that this is something that uh, has uh, the capacity to actually go the distance for people and address really serious issues. And then the last book is called Mindfulness for All. And it's about uh, the potential to bring mindfulness into the domain of not just the body and medicine, but the body politic. And it's about what we've learned about the mind-body connection in medicine and in uh, science in the past 40 years. And making the argument that it would be really useful rather than taking a geopolitical power orientation towards you know history and the unfolding of nation states and so forth to take a more medical diagnostic perspective on what why is this body politic ailing 
why are we so divided? Why do we hate each other? Why do we fall into camps and believe different things and throw uh, falsehoods at each other as if they were true when everybody's kind of like playing it from their side? And the uh, upstart of it is that we're so divided that it's almost like a cancer, you could say, growing on the, you know, in the body politic. And since we gave ourselves, or Linnaeus, when he was developing the, you know, phyla and naming of, uh, you know, the, the animal kingdom and plant kingdom, he gave human beings the name Homo sapiens sapiens. So from the Latin sapere, which means to taste or to know, and it's really to taste is to know something directly. You could, the example I use is you could read the Encyclopedia of Bananas for the next hundred years and know everything there was to know about the chemistry and biochemistry of bananas. Uh, but you take one bite of a banana and you know a lot more than that. And it's much more relevant knowledge. So uh, this is kind of not merely conceptual knowing, but Homo sapiens sapiens refers to a kind of direct experiential knowing that we have a word for and we never really teach about it in school or even in the university and, and that word is called awareness we're sentient beings we are we don't understand sentience we don't know how we get sentience how we get awareness how we get that kind of sensibility out of stuff out of neurons out of you know three pounds of 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 uh, cells in the head, trillions of connections, synaptic connections, billions and billions of cells. And then what the book is about. Hmm. You say sentient, and it comes to mind as conscious. You know, to yeah. Be well, conscious. consciousness is one meaning of sentient. But we're everyone is on. We're is a collusion from the world to put us on autopilot. Yeah. Whether it whether it's to check our phone or whether it's any of those things. So to be conscious that you're conscious, I don't think, you know, if you're unconscious and there's no awareness of, of, of getting through the day, you know, life is, there's so many cliches, but they're cliches for a good reason. Life is what happens to you. What, but if you miss it, you know. Yeah, um, well, that's, you just nailed it, Steve, because it's like, Homo sapiens sapiens, the species that is aware and is aware that it is aware. So that gives you this sort of meta awareness perspective, this what I call an orthogonal rotation in consciousness, where you just have more dimensionality to your life. So you can be in wiser relationship with what arises or even create and imagine new possibilities in ways you can't when you're zoning through your moments on autopilot the way you're talking about. And that should be like, you know, and it's becoming actually part of K through 12 education. You know, right. learning that when we're young because the younger you learn how to pay attention, the younger you learn how to recruit your own awareness in your own self-interest, uh, the more those synaptic connections get formed and the more effectively you will live your life in ways that cause least amount of harm to yourself and others and the maximum amount of good. So uh, in this section, I'd like to like now look a little bit, two things in the remainder of this little session. I'd like to get a little bit deeper into book one, you know, what's covered in book one sure. and also you said yesterday for people watching this, it's a few, it'll be a few weeks from now or whenever, but you were on NPR yesterday and you mentioned there might've been some things you wished you had said. Is that still relevant or should we just go right into, into book one? Whenever we're in conversation like this or people are calling up a radio station, they're calling up because they have a certain kind of motive. They've had, they've had, they have a kind of motive. They're driven to connect. And uh, one of the beauties of talk radio is that you actually can listen to another, even if they have a different point of view, and connect with that person. The people who called up really were uh, reporting on uh, the va value of mindfulness in their lives. They didn't get it from me. I don't know how they got it, 
But, you know, they both said, this saved my life or this transformed my life. And one was, uh, you know, uh, had been uh, on several deployments in Afghanistan. And he was saying, like, he, that's where he learned it. He was practicing. He learned it in Afghanistan. So listening to people like that really is more important than listening to me because they are in some sense touched by it in a way that's direct and authentic. And then other people are going to say, well, you know, if people like that can actually benefit from this, then that's a lot different from a professor at a medical school sense. And the woman who, uh, who had cancer, uh, she was a mindfulness teacher in, or she used mindfulness practice to teach, I think she said in high school or college. Yeah, yeah. And uh, she, she had to put the rubber to the road and she, with her diagnosis, she had a, you know, thankfully, she, it sounded like she had... What I regret about that was that I would have liked to have been in more conversation with no, her. Oh, I know, I know. That's why I bring it up. These things are scripted in a certain way. That didn't happen. But for people who are listening to our podcast, I mean, I think the most important thing is you and I in, in conversation are actually, um, in some sense, representing possibilities for other people when they tune in to not just what we're saying, but in some sense where the conversation is pointing. And it's always pointing to you, to how, the listener, to the, the viewer, to how am I in relationship with my own experience, inwardly and outwardly, whether it's family, whether it's work, whether it's my own health, uh, whether it's my, you know, whatever it is. Uh, and that's always uh, a subject or a domain where we are capable of enormous growth. And yeah, and again, part of my whole reason for starting Wisdom Feed at this point is, uh, I, like I've mentioned it before, but a lot of my friends, you know, are not into, a lot of my friends are, but my friends from Brooklyn or think when I get together with them, you know, as they get older, you know, you could talk about being in the zone, you know, any sports metaphor, you know, I can talk about being Everybody in the zone and then they would get it, what mindfulness is. And you can kind of segue into that. Um, but more often than not, you get older or when you're younger, you have health issues and stress and stress related drugs that are taken. And some of them are discovering it on their own mindfulness, wellness, relaxation, mm -hmm. And uh, but like you said, when it when it when it's personal, all of a sudden it's you know it's a lot more relevant. You'll try anything, especially that, if there's no, that's no right. side and, effects. And I love it, you know, with our patients in the stress reduction clinic. That's fabulous motivation. Is, hey, listen, I've tried everything else. Why don't I, you know, which is all outer related or pills or surgery or whatever? Why don't I try befriending myself and seeing what this, you know, what this apparatus, what this life that I have, this body that I have, this mind that I have, can actually do. And the irony is that it's not about doing, but when you drop into being, it so profoundly influences your doing that when the, this sounds a little crazy, but when your doing comes out of being, comes out of awareness, comes out of mindfulness, comes out of heartfulness, it's an entirely different kind of doing and it's infinitely more satisfying and often uh it's it's in itself healing and transformative of larger things than just yourself right and we could go into the science of it but right now i'd, I'd like to kind of well we'll do that when we get to book three <laughs> which exactly. isn't published yet so in, in book one and you know uh, you know my so We'll talk about this in the next segment about my, my, my children. But I, owe, I have a 15-year-old, 13-year-old boys. So if I show them a picture like this picture. Oh, uh, yeah. Book. The old lady, young lady. Yeah, the, the old lady, young lady, and... Uh, but you know, it's the you other picture. Like, to, yes. to, to, if you go back two pages, the picture you'd show them first is... But this one with the triangle, or...? No, no, there's another picture. With the elephant? No, there should the be. A, isn't there a, an old lady? Is this the old? Yes, that's the picture. Right, right, right. That picture is the ambiguous one. 
You can look at it. Why don't you hold it up a little longer? So let me, oh, you know what? Let, let's go to this view, and this way it'll stay up while you talk. Oh, really? You can look at that picture, and some people, and I've done this with audiences of thousands of people. Some people, I say, how many of you see the, the old woman, an old woman? And like, you know, 50% of people will raise their hands. And then I'll say, well, how many of you see a young woman? And another 50% of the audience will raise their hands, and they are overlapping. But uh, a lot of people only see the old woman. They don't see the young woman. And a lot of people only see the uh, young woman. They don't see the old woman. Now, if you turn the page again, those, those other photos that you started out with, those other figures, they show it so that anybody would see the, old, the young woman or the old woman. So then they say, oh my God, why didn't I see that at first? Because as soon as you point it out, you realize it. Well, the reason those, uh, that image is in the book is because it's trying to make the point that we see, but we don't actually see. We see so much on autopilot that often we don't uh, apprehend what's actually in front of our eyes. And it's fine when it's just one of these trick figures. But what about, uh, and you so you can take it down now, but what about when it's your children? What about when it's your partner or spouse? Or what about when it's your work and you're only seeing it in a certain way and you're missing all the possibilities? Or if it's your health. Or, or if your it's health. a relationship. Anything. Anything. That's why paying attention and recruiting more dimensions of seeing or hearing or smelling or tasting or touching or knowing, which the Buddhists would regard as a sixth sense, awareness as a sixth sense. Well, that's what coming to our senses, the original book, was all about is using our senses as doorways into direct experience of living life as if it really, 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 really mattered. And not zoning through your moments to get the better moments, only in the end, say, to be on your deathbed and realize, holy cow, I got the whole thing wrong. I was just zoning along on autopilot thinking I knew who was right, what was wrong, uh, not paying attention to these things, not paying attention to those things. All of a sudden I wake up on my deathbed and realize I got the whole bloody thing wrong. I was like cantankerous and I wasn't, was mean, wasn't friend. Oh, I only saw the old woman only because I never, thought to, I never thought to look at anything else. Precisely. And then you're dead. And then you drop into your grave. So Thoreau, you know, and someplace in the book, there's a quote from Thoreau about going to Walden where he said just that. I went to the woods because I wish to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what they had to teach and not when I came to die, discover that I hadn't lived. And it, we were all at great risk for that. And, you know, Thoreau was like, he was like a poet of mindfulness. He was like a lyricist of mindfulness. All of Walden is about that quality of attention and awareness when you get out of your own way. So any, not final thoughts, but any final thoughts in relationship to, uh, to the book? Uh, What's well, in book you know, one? Like a, to book like one? Meant to be a poetic expression so that, uh, I think you spoke about it a little bit earlier in terms of your own experience of reading it, but I try to write in a way where the people who are reading it are entrained into mindfulness. They'll get it not by trying to, be mindful, but because they can't help it because the words are kind of a little bit like music, or at least that's the intention. They carry you into a realizing of your own experience in a way you may not have before. So that's part of like waking you up. Not to me, not to how good the book is, but to you. The book is only meant to be useful as a tool to connect you, the reader, whoever you are, to yourself. And the book is just a clever instrument and it gives you a lot of background. So, you know, in like where mindfulness comes from, what the deep structure of it is, the fact that it was, you know, often spoken of as the heart of Buddhist meditation, but uh, it's universal. It's about attention and awareness. So it's, it's, you know, that's universal. Everybody's capable of paying attention and being aware. And I love the, what is it, double entendre or play on words? Meditation is not what you think. 
Yeah, well, that's it definitely a play on words in the double entendre, absolutely. And, uh, you know, someone once gave me a, a T-shirt with that expression on it. And, and that's also one of the um, titles of the chapter in, in part one. So can I get the T-shirt that goes with the book? Just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, on the internet, you can get anything, <laughs> as you all well right. know. All right, so that's our conversation about book one. And uh, well, thank you for, you know, thank you, thank you for making the opportunity for or offering the opportunity for me to do this. With you. My, my pleasure. And thanks. Uh, pleasure having you as a guest and I enjoy the conversation and hopefully uh, other folks uh, might find it interesting as well. Yeah, great. And if you get any feedback about it. Um, oh, yeah. So you know. where, where are we posting this? If you've read book one. Or if you just watch this video and you want to give any comments about it, you can just post it right, you know, right under uh, where the video is. We'd love to have some feedback from you. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, John.